Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today. This is Brittany Bacall with Next Generation. Uh, for those of you who have, who have attended uh, our webinars in the past, you're probably used to hearing my voice. We're actually going to do something a little different today, and we have a special guest with us today. We have Tom Linehan with Bank United, and rather than just speaking about self-directed IRAs and how they work with certain types of investments and asset classes, today we wanted to talk about an equally, if not more important topic, which is uh, preventing cyber fraud. Um, as most of you know, this is a growing issue. And Tom is uh, well-versed on the topic, and he's going to provide some information about the landscape as it relates to some trends that we're seeing, as well as some examples of things to look out for to avoid cyber fraud, whether it's for a self-directed IRA that you have with us or any other types of uh, investment accounts that you have or even personal investments. And with that, I will let Tom um, jump into this. And what we'll do at the end is we'll um, save some time for any questions that we might have. The broadcast is being recorded, so anyone who registered to attend today will receive an email copy. Um, and with that, Tom, I'll, I'll give it over to you. Thank you very much, Brittany, and uh, welcome, folks, this afternoon. Um, Tom Linehan, I'm with Bank United. I'm the Executive Vice President and Director of our National Deposits Group, uh, where we work on a national basis with companies like Next Generation and helping them with their banking, but also helping them and their clientele in fighting um, cyber fraud, uh, email fraud, any type of um, wire fraud. And it's really our pleasure here to team up with NextGen and Erica and Brittany to bring you this program. Um, we have been presenting this program to folks like yourselves now for probably the past six or seven years um, with the advent of, <clears throat> excuse me, business email compromise, which we'll focus on today. Now, there is obviously many, many forms of cyber fraud, and there's many, many forms of the technolog technological fraud, if you will, on what these fraudsters use and how they go about uh, trying to gain uh, financial benefit from either duping or systems access to you know, unsuspecting victims. Uh, what this presentation is designed to do is to kind of take the uh, listener or the viewer through the different types that we see here um, and to hope, hopefully give some guidance on how to protect yourself. And what we found certainly in the self-directed IRA space is many, many clients do indeed um, invest in real estate, hold those real estate holdings in IRAs. So I think the program today is uh, very pertinent and very topical for folks who might be investing in real estate or perhaps uh, selling their home to buy another. Uh, just good things to look out for. It's, it's a low-tech kind of presentation. So if you're like me and not too technical, it's somewhat easy to understand. So, so we hope you get a lot out of it. And again, thank you, Brittany and the team uh, for, for including us. Um, I'm going to try to advance the uh, screen now. There we go. Okay, so the first thing um, <clears throat> we'd like to talk about is uh, business email compromise has been around now for many, many years, probably going on about 10 years, uh, easily 10 years. And, uh, okay, here we go. We're going to try to see if we can get there. And um, the first uh, lawsuit was settled uh, just this past year from a case that happened in 2016 where an unsuspecting buyer um, received an email to wire out their proceeds for the purchase of a real estate property. And unfortunately, the email was not from the buyer's real estate agent as they thought it was. It was from the fraudsters. And what's significant about this case is, is that the real estate agent uh, was held liable for about 80% of the loss. And that real estate agent had to write a check for 167000 to make uh, appropriations back to their client. Um, so again, being that this is the first case that has been uh, jury or decided by a jury, it's important to know that there's now legal precedent. I'll get back to this in the presentation for you uh, to talk a little bit about it after we kind of go through some of the backgrounds of, of what this scam is. And uh, we're going to advance the page here. So, so how did it all begin on business email compromise, which is, again is the acronym BEC? Um, the fraudsters use malware, and uh, for those on the phone who are technical, uh, you probably know more about malware than I do. 
what I know about malware or malicious software is uh, it basically gets picked up unknowingly by a victim either through opening an email uh, attachment that they're not quite sure who it's from or by visiting certain websites uh, where this malware now is loaded onto uh, the person's computer. And through that malware, uh, the bad guys now have an ability to access uh, directories, access email files, um, and see and watch and track uh, all the communication between the unsuspecting individual and uh, potentially counterparties, especially when it comes to a real estate transaction like a home sale or a uh, investor real estate sale. Um, it is through this software, uh, which basically can be picked up on the dark web today for about $500, that they kind of start out to wield their uh, their tools of their trade, so to speak, right? Um, recent examples of, of trying to get people to open up emails that contain the malware so it gets uploaded could be from the IRS, Federal Reserve, the FDIC. Um, it's also, again, as I said, distributed through websites, pop-ups, social networks, uh, some removable media, something you may have gotten uh, at a trade show that may have had uh, something on it, uh, that could one of those uh, memory sticks. Uh, one other thing to keep in mind here is that the IRS will never, ever email you uh, if there is something that they need from you, whether it be clarification of the tax return, <clears throat> um, information or additional information on a return, the IRS never emails anyone. They will always send a letter or use the U.S. mail. They will never call you and they will never email you. So if you're getting an email from the IRS, the chances are that it's fake and it could be an opportunity through fraudsters to try to um, get you to click a link and to uh, upload or download this malware. You know, one of the things uh, we see a lot around the holidays, and maybe you, you folks on the phone may have gotten them too, is you get a lot of emails that end up in your junk file that say they're from Amazon, UPS, Federal Express about a delivery, and to track that delivery and click here. Um, again, I know it because I've lived this every day, but a lot of unsuspecting people may think, oh, it must be a package that they're trying to deliver. They'll click the link. They'll show a fake page that, that has some sort of mambo jambo and tracking information, but you're most likely uploading some malware. Uh, how do you know if you have malware? Well, certain uh, software systems are out there. Um, certainly, uh, there's things like McAfee and, and Norton, uh, but certainly if your computer is kind of working very slowly, um, if you're trying to go onto your online banking and it's repeating prompts for passwords and IDs, um, certainly, if your computer is just kind of behaving in a way that it just doesn't seem like it's acting properly, the key here is to stop. Um, if you use the computer for online banking, call your bank immediately that you work with, <clears throat> excuse me, to uh, say you may have malware, and then certainly uh, get a, get an IT professional or a firm to to help see if you can see the malware threat and get it removed from your computer. So we move from malware, uh, which is going to how the fraudsters kind of gain access to uh, folks' computers, but they also do what's called these business email compromise, and that's kind of where we are today. Um, what business email compromise really is in general is either going through someone's access uh, email account to send out fraudulent emails or spoofing uh, unknown counterparties or known uh, uh, firm uh, principals and firms in order to send these fake emails out to subordinates or to people involved in a transaction in order to get them to move money. What we're seeing here on the program are actual headlines taken off the web of victims who have uh, unfortunately been built out of hundreds of thousands if not millions of dollars through this methodology. Um, it doesn't take a lot of technology to try to uh, make up a fake email account in order to try to get a CEO, a CFO in a company to send money out thinking it was from the CEO. The top headline there is that an Austrian firm uh, fired their CEO after a $56 million cyber scam. What that scam was, was the CFO receiving an email who they thought was from the CEO to move this money for a top secret, very time sensitive deal. And the CFO went and moved the money 
but unfortunately it wasn't the email, original email was not from the CEO, it was from fraudsters that set up email accounts almost mimicking perfectly that of the CEO. They followed social media and knew that the CEO was out of the country, so the CFO would have had a harder time getting a hold of that person, and that's kind of when they struck. Uh, you'll see down a few, the Denver couple, maybe more prudent to, uh, to what our audience is today, where a Denver couple was scammed out of $300,000. Uh, they were buying their dream home to move near their children, and they received an email that they thought was their real estate agent to send the, loan pro the purchase proceeds to the title company, but unfortunately it wasn't from the realtor, it was from the scammers that were pretending to be the realtor. Uh, again, the individual, the general public not knowing this is going on, they went online and they wired the money thinking they were sending it to the bank account for the title company, but it was going to an account controlled by the uh, fraudsters. Um, certainly, uh, uh, the uh, FBI warns that there will be a dramatic increase or continue to be an increase in email scams. And then down on the bottom, you can see ransomware. Ransomware is another form of cyber terrorism or cyber fraud where your servers in a company um, or a practice or a firm where the servers get held, literally held hostage um, for unless the victim pays a payment, most likely and usually in Bitcoin, uh, in order to have the servers released. Um, in 2017, it was about a $250 million a year scam. Uh, it crossed the billion dollar mark in 2018. show you a little bit more again associated on the real estate front which we'll focus on today is and some of these actually do you know break your heart one of the things uh, uh, that we try to show with this slide is that the cyber fraudsters aren't prejudiced they uh, they don't necessarily earmark their scam for any sort of uh, uh, socioeconomic uh, you know uh, criteria we have couples in Colorado who lose 272,000, and we have judges in New York who lost almost who lost over a million dollars where she thought she was uh, wiring the proceeds from the sale of her property to purchase another property. Um, again, in Maryland, uh, for instance, faked an email to fool a settlement company into wiring them the proceeds, uh, and that was about 411,000. Uh, the key, going back to that first slide, is in many of these cases, um, everyone is a victim. Uh, the realtor is the victim. We've got to remember that. The realtor is not the bad person. They're an identity theft victim. Uh, so when lawsuits start to happen, um, there is really no perpetrator or no plaintiff. The plaintiffs are usually out of the country. So everyone involved in the lawsuit who, and everyone involved in the transaction usually gets sued. Everyone is there defending themselves. Uh, in addition to the person who lost the money. Um, so that first case is very important because if you're in the business of, uh, in the real estate uh, in profession, whether you're a settlement agent or a title agent or a realtor, uh, good to know this is happening. So for those on the phone that perhaps work with the realtor and work today and have done business with that realtor, please reach out to them and let them know you attended this webinar now you understand what's going on so that they're aware because uh, we, pro we provided this presentation to 400 realtors in Lancaster, Pennsylvania uh, about two months ago and a majority of the room were unaware that this was happening, which, which is kind of unbelievable. But again, the, the general public is getting hit today and getting these scams and it's very difficult to obviously track that. Uh, some specs, and I have been doing this, as I said, probably going on seven years. Uh, back in 2013, when we started to realize that clients were being uh, compromised and sending legitimate funds to fraudulent bank accounts, uh, it was about a $2.3 billion scam. These were primarily the CEO to the CFO scams that we just talked about. They were also where the counterparties in a real estate transaction like the settlement agent or the title company were being duped into sending net proceeds to a fake account. So it was about 2.3 million. Uh, within a year uh, and a little bit, it grew another 800,000. It's just around the 
the May 16th, uh, the May of 16, excuse me, where we started to see now individuals are being scammed. And that's what has now resulted in exponential growth in this scam. It's uh, the FBI estimated 18 was going to be about 7 billion. In fact, it's a, oh, well over 12 billion in losses um, through this scam. Uh, for everyone that we thwart, it's one for us, but it's certainly a situation where we have to be right 100% of the time and the bad guys only have to be right once. The one thing we do see is that the bad guys do not retire scams. Uh, CEOs and CFOs are still, you know, they're the big pockets, they're the firms, they're still getting these fake emails. In fact, we, we did this presentation for a client and their disbursement team out in Ohio. And by the time I got back to the airport, I got a phone call from the CFO that said, you know, I, as soon as you left, I got a fake email from the CEO to move money. And had you not done this presentation, I would have thought to do it, but it made me call the CEO on the, their cell phone to confirm it. And they said, no, we did not send that. Uh, if you look down at the bottom, uh, the combination of simplicity and effectiveness have ensured that this scam, BEC, will continue to be one of the most popular attacks especially for those who lack special tools and knowledge to pull off more complicated schemes. Uh, we all may remember when uh, it was on the line that, uh, you know, when we all got on email originally and we're starting to get the Nigerian Prince emails and we still have some people get them today or the email where, hey, I'm in Europe and I broke my leg, can you send me a few hundred dollars? This is really those same scams, but, you know, taken to the next level. They are all about social engineering, uh, less technical, a lot more uh, trying to convince people that the email they're, get, they're receiving is the email from a trusted counterparty. And that is, again, the reason why there's such tremendous growth. So as I mentioned, it's not account takeover. It's not a breach of security. Uh, email compromise schemes involve impersonation, really, and social engineering. That's probably the, the two big pieces of this, which obviously, as we said, results in the victim submitting uh, seemingly legitimate transaction instructions for a financial institution to execute. One of the things to keep in mind is um, if you receive this, these emails and you act upon them and you go online or go down to your local bank and you authorize the transfer, uh, it's, it's very rare, if at all, that you will get financial restitution from your bank because basically you did authorize it. It was a it was a legitimate transaction from a perspective of initiating and approving moving the money, but certainly we know it was illegitimate in terms of the information that you received. Uh, so again, unlike an account takeover, you know, criminal will access your account and they're able to directly execute transactions. Now, banks and companies like NextGen and, uh, you know, most financial uh, counterparties have taken tremendous steps, tremendous investment to create firewalls and security and safety for clients to ensure that breaches uh, don't occur. Again, as good crooks do, they look down the chain and find the weakest link. And this does, as I said, doesn't, create, doesn't necessitate any type of breach. They just basically start sending these fake emails in the hope that someone out there will make a financial transaction based on them. Um, what we find is uh, to show you a little bit how it works is uh, stage one is you have your cyber terrorist. I think that's the universal symbol for a cyber fraudster, uh, the hoodie and the laptop. And that cyber fraudster through the use of malware now gains control of someone's email accounts and starts watching and notices that uh, uh, here's, a, here's an unsuspecting victim who's communicating via email with their real estate agent and their attorney in anticipation of a real estate closing. At the appropriate time, the uh, whether that fraudster is submitting a fake email out to an individual to move money or trying to submit a fake email from pretending to be the individual sending their banking information to a title company or to a settlement agent, you'll see that in stage two, that's where they attack. And they attack in, a, in perfect timing and because they've been watching the email traffic, they know exactly when to strike. And what happens here, as I just mentioned earlier, is the client who is now, or remitting, and the remitter has now put in 
legitimate wire instructions based on the information they receive in order to send uh, the money out to an account that they believe is going either to a trusted counterparty if you're an individual or out to the individual if you happen to be a firm um, like a title settlement agent or a, any type of company that is holding other people's money and making a disbursement. Uh, the fraudulent transactions, direct wire transfers to the criminal's domestic or foreign bank accounts. Um, and uh, there are banks in particular areas in China and Hong Kong that are very common destinations, and that is not by accident. Uh, what we found is there's areas in China that um, if we call out as the remitting bank, if a client alerts us that they believe they've been involved in a fraud, uh, there's areas in China that under China law do not provide information as to whether or not the money is in the bank or not. You literally have to hire a law firm and to file an injunction in order to find out if the money's still at the bank. Okay, just in uh, summary, uh, obviously BEC schemes target finance institutions, customers, uh, criminals seek to unlawfully access the email accounts of a company's executive, which would be, say, the real estate broker, uh, the employee and the agents, or the buyers and sellers, as mentioned, to directly submit uh, fraudulent transaction instructions by impersonating uh, the above through emails and documentation related to the requested transfer, or mislead the company employee into submitting fraudulent transaction instructions uh, to the financial institution by impersonating either a supplier, the company executive, or a trusted counterparty. Uh, if you think about it, um, a real estate transaction is perhaps the most perfect scenario to try to defraud. We have uh, a structured uh, deal that involves many counterparties, right? A typical uh, real estate transaction could have eight or nine counterparties. Uh, any one of those counterparties uh, between the buyer's attorney, the seller's attorney, the buyer, the seller, the realtors uh, for the seller, the realtor for the buyer, uh, the home inspector, a home appraiser, a, a commercial appraiser. Uh, any one of those could perhaps uh, become compromised and now the bad guys have a window in and to watch the traffic. Um, as we say here, it's very rampant in the mortgage title and real estate industries and they're preying upon unsuspecting buyers and sellers through compromised email accounts. So I'd like to take you through is a couple of the different scenarios that we have seen here at the bank. And again, uh, hopefully, as you see in this presentation, this is not that technical. It's not really about software and about things you can do uh, from a technical perspective. A lot of this is based on social engineering and about being aware. Obviously, we talked a little bit about scenario one. That is really a pandemic, if you will, in the real estate industry where the criminal hacks or uses an email account of the borrower's real estate agent or settlement attorney to send fraudulent wire transfer instructions to the borrower or the buyer. And based on this request, the borrower requests of their financial institution to issue a wire transfer and sends the funds to an account the criminal controls. Obviously, in this scenario, the criminal impersonating the borrower or the buyer's trusted counterparty prompted the buyer financial institution execute an authorized wire. Again, back to my earlier comments, this is an actual authorized wire because it's being authorized by the authorized user or authorized entitled user, whether it be on an online banking or someone going to a branch. This, if there's any page in this presentation to keep and to show a realtor that you may work with, uh, keep this one and show it to them to make sure that they're aware. Um, and to discuss with your realtor how that realtor is going to provide you with the banking information. I mean, we do still have to get our proceeds in order for a purchase to get to the appropriate uh, parties, uh, but it's good to know and, and to really, at the point of engagement, understand how communication is going to be done and to ensure that perhaps when you're face-to-face, -face, you get whatever banking information uh, there is. On uh, scenario two, we have a situation where, uh, again, going on, it's almost like flipping the script, is where the criminal uses an email account of Company A's customer to send fraudulent wire instructions to Company A. We saw this a lot in the real estate industry early on. A lot of our clients uh, were putting in internal protocols, internal procedures in order to make sure that the emails they were receiving that had clients 
wiring information was authentic through callbacks prior to the closing and through uh, uh, communications outside of email. Uh, obviously, we talked about this. Uh, we've had the firms then, if they received the bad information, ended up sending wires out and then certainly uh, realizing, unfortunately, after the fact that they had gone and sent it to an account, but the bad guy controls, and which is very, very difficult for us to stop and get the money back. We'll get into a little bit of that on what happens if that should occur. In scenario three, we talked a little bit about this. This is still a very popular uh, you know, scam for those who may be a CEO or CFO in a prospective uh, uh, you know, firm, or you're a sole, self, uh, sole proprietor, but you have an assistant. These are, are typical that we see where, again, it, it's an intercompany scam where uh, the bad guys spoof the email of the actual CEO to try to get subordinates like CFOs or controllers or someone in the accounts payable department to move money. Again, a lot of the ways to prevent this is that we certainly have protocols and procedures in place so no one person could move money, or there's always an internal callback if for some reason an internal employee is of, of the principal of the company is sending emails out to move money. Again, very easy once you know what's going on to try to put procedures in place to try to prevent, but if you don't know what's going on, you know, we do use email as our primary source of communication. And one of the last examples we see uh, hits a lot of companies, no matter what size you are, where we've actually had scenarios where uh, emails, suppliers were emailing invoices versus mailing. Uh, so they were electronically delivering their PDFs or their in invoices on a file. We saw these emails intercepted, we, or they, we saw these emails uh, spoofed where an exact replica of the invoice was done on a PDF or on a file, uh, but the banking information was changed and then forwarded on to someone in accounts payable to pay. Again, uh, when we go out and show companies this, uh, they immediately put revisios and procedures in place where you would not pay off an email. You go to the file, and if you're electronically paying your vendors, you pay them by the banking information you have on the file, not on the banking information that's on the invoice, as well as you don't call back to confirm the phone number that's on the email because, believe it or not, these fraudsters are excellent also in trying to spoof and trying to you know, work their craft via telephone. We've had clients tell us that they know that the bad guys are on the phone. They're trying to get them to move the money, and they're just – incredibly good at trying to convince people on the phone they, they are who they say they are. So I'd like to take you folks through perhaps something uh, if you're on the phone and you do invest in real estate or, or have purchased uh, real estate is something that would be very familiar. Uh, we call this the anatomy of a business email compromise. Uh, obviously these are what we call the primary actors or players. You have uh, the cyber fraudster. There's our universal symbol. Uh, we have our title exchange company, uh, the taxpayer, seller or buyer, and then obviously the remitting bank and the beneficiary bank. Again, your primary players in this saga. Um, your additional players, obviously, as we said before, because the real estate transaction has many, many uh, counterparties. You have your real estate agent. Uh, you have your settlement attorney your home appraiser, and your home inspector. So that's about nine counterparties, as I count, right in just a simple transaction as such. And as we take a look at the transaction, uh, here we have a, a, the cyber fraudster in a scenario that through the distribution of malware, as we spoke about earlier, the cyber thief has hacked into the email account of John Smith. Mr. Smith is presently scheduling the closing of a purchase of a $500,000 investment property. Um, what we have found out through investigations and working with clients, um, the bad guys have tracked real estate transactions for almost two and a half to three months where they're watching all the email traffic going back and forth before they strike. Uh, Smith previously sold uh, an investment property and uh, is currently working with his real estate attorney and USA Title, which is a national provider of title insurance. 
The cyber thief has been following the email traffic between Smith and his realtor, as I mentioned before, in this scenario for about 60 days and is fully aware of the scheduled date of the closing and the amount of the transaction and who at USA Title is the primary contact to receive information. Uh, prior to the scheduled closing, the cyber thief creates a fraudulent email to mimic that of Mr. Smith's realtor and sends the false wire instructions for the title company to Smith's email account. Smith receives the instructions, issues an outbound wire transfer uh, to, the, to his bank via his online banking. Uh, the bank receives the instructions, again, legitimately set up by Smith and sends the funds as instructed. However, the funds are being remitted to an account to criminal controls. The funds are received at the beneficiary bank, deposited into an account set up by the cyber thief with further wire instructions to send the funds to an offshore bank account. What we found over the years is we started to get uh, very, very sensitive and scrutinized foreign wires associated with our real estate related and clientele. Uh, so the bad guys obviously saw that many of these foreign wires were being held. And uh, so what they do today is they set up domestic accounts uh, to receive the funds before they send them overseas. Uh, with the hope that uh, it'll hit the account with forwarding wire instructions and then move on. Uh, in this case, Smith receives a Fed number, which is we all love, that it shows that we sent the money. Uh, however, um, uh, the funds, uh, he, although he gets the Fed number, the funds never get to USA title. Um, and now what, right? What now if you unfortunately become a victim? In this scenario, as as you said earlier, in scenario one, the criminal was impersonating, I apologize, the criminal was impersonating a trusted party. Pause here. Uh, and it prompted the individual to uh, execute the authorized wire transfer. Okay, we're going to go a little bit further here. Okay, so how you could defend yourself in a company if we're doing this uh, as we did for our clients is obviously. Uh, you have to be educated, and you have to be educated on what business email compromise scams are. Uh, hopefully, we did some of that today. Become aware of what is out there. Um, obviously, if someone sends you an email to send them money, you would scrutinize it. However, uh, the bad guys absolutely count on when you're involved in a real estate transaction, there's many, many moving parts. I can, I'll say it again, there's many, many different parties that become involved with you. Uh, so they count on somewhat that there might be a little vagueness or there might be some pressure, there might be some time pressure and people drop their guard when that happens. Obviously stress, uh, I still believe that a real estate transaction is the most expensive and biggest investment someone will make regardless of the size. And uh, there's a lot of stress associated with that. So obviously you want to scrutinize all emails. Uh, if you receive an email uh, uh, coming from a trusted counterparty to move money, an easy way to see if it's truly from that person that we have made aware of is it reply to all. And um, your email system, whatever you're using, should be able to show the whole email address. So you want to make sure that you compare the email address uh, to the email address you may have in your records. What these scammers do is to make it so closely match a legitimate email that in most email systems truncate, and that's why you believe it's from who you think it's from. Um, they will replace the letter L with the digit one or vice versa. Uh, so my email address of uh, tlinehan at bankunited.com might be set up as t digit one uh, I N E H A N at bankunited.com, bankunited.com at Gmail. Uh, so it's important to, to look at that. And then obviously, you know, raise awareness to the people around you. you know, raise awareness to your business partners, to your family. Uh, we did this presentation at a college that had a cyber security more, uh, ma uh, major, and um, many of the professors and the, the trustees of the college came up to us after it and said, I didn't know this was going on. My whole family invests in real estate. Uh, this is great information. We want to thank you for making us aware of it. Uh, obviously, verify any changes in vendor payments uh, or locations. You know, one of the things the scammers do 
is they try to, at the last minute, change the methodology of payment. Um, if you were purchasing a real estate property and you were going to pay with it by check and everyone agreed you were going to pay with it through a cashier's check or a bank check, but then at the last minute you got an email from the realtor that said, you know what, the seller would prefer a wire. You, you got to step back and go, okay, my method of payment is changing at the last minute. That is a very, very important piece to confirm back. So you want to pick up the phone, you want to call your realtor, the number you have on your file and say, hey, did you just send me a, a message that we're changing from a bank check to a wire? Just to make sure they do that, they will change the methodology of payment you know, late in the transaction or almost at the point where if you don't act immediately, you'll lose the opportunity because they're not going to accept the check anymore or vice versa, right? Uh, obviously, stay updated on 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 the online, uh, stay updated on uh, uh, in the realty age in the realtor, you know, American Land Title Association has a great website. Uh, again, if you're an investor in real estate on this topic and to help protect yourself, uh, obviously verify requests. We talked about that. Make sure that if there's any emails that come in, you reply to all to see if it's truly from your trusted counterparty. We put client engagement here. I think, as I said before, this is really where at the start you can help protect yourself, no matter if it's a real estate deal, no matter if you're working with next gen, if you're thinking about working with next gen, uh, you know, talk to the people like Brittany and Erica and the team there about, you know, how um, you're going to get communication about, you know, disbursements and collections to make sure that, you know, you're all on the same page. And then obviously there's a website here that the FBI, it's called the IC3, the Internet Crime Complaint Center. Um, this email address is open to anyone to go see. It's a website that's full of great information. And certainly they do keep stats on uh, business email compromise. Uh, we've read recently over the past maybe year, 18 months, they have had made arrests. So we're making some progress in our fight, but we have a long way to go. Uh, with 10 million real estate transactions a year, give or take, that's a lot of opportunity for the cyber fraudsters to, you know, work their craft. Um, here's an example, uh, a real example of a cyber fraud business email compromise. So this was allegedly from a borrower or a buyer uh, for net proceeds uh, out to one of our clients. Uh, as you can see, um, the email came from Robert so-and-so. We tried to block the names, even protecting the bad guy. But um, you see that this person's email address was officestocks at cox.net. So I'm not sure anyone named Robert B. would have an email address called officestocks. Unfortunately, the uh, dispersion team didn't catch that. Uh, the subject was the name of the mortgage and the address of the mortgage because they've been watching they, they knew exactly all this information and then they obviously had the email address of um the person who was supposed to be the actual you know per, uh, buyer so there's your wire amount please ensure it's sent today this was supposed to be for a trusted counterparty here's the bank name here's the routing number and then here's where you may see if you get an email like this to send money, you'll see that they don't change the name. They can't change the name on the bank account. But what they do in the wire instructions is they include their name on the wire instructions. Today, uh, the UCC code for banks to deposit money in accounts through wire is by bank account only not by name match. Now, many banks voluntarily are name matching uh, when they could try to catch something like this. So in other words, the wire would have went to Acme Settlement Services and that's their bank. That is not their bank account information, obviously. The name of the account the bad person set up at the other bank is called Deborah Artist and this is Deborah Artist's bank account information. They include the Acme Settlement Services title to trick the sender. When the bank that Deborah Artist banks with receives the money as long as the account number is correct by law they need to fund. So again, this is a situation where the bad guys know the banking system better than we do and I work for a bank and they know how to get around the certain rules. Now, the good news is 
there is legislation being put into Congress by an Illinois congressman that is working with the Fed in order to change the way banks fund to include name match. Uh, I think we got a ways to go. I think we have algorithms to build, but that should help, uh, you know, thin out or at least make it more difficult for people like Deborah Artis to, uh, you know, to thwart or to try to scam people. Okay, so what do you do if, uh, unfortunately, you're a victim? Uh, this is a very important, this is the second page, I think, in the program that's very important to know. There is a process in banking called wire recall. And what wire recall is, is you've wired money to a beneficiary, you're the remitter, um, you contact your bank and you say, listen, I sent the, uh, the money, I'm working with the recipient, in this case, let's say it was Next Generation Trust. You know, I sent Next Generation Trust money, funds, but it was the wrong amount. Um, I'd like to recall the wire. Well, your bank would contact Next Generation Trust Bank to say we've got a recall request from the remitter. Next Generation Bank will connect with whomever is their contacts at the company and say, hey, Mr. Smith sent you money, it was the wrong amount, I'd like to recall the wire and resend. Next Generation Trust says, sure, we're working with Mr. Smith, we know of it, it's okay. The beneficiary bank needs permission to debit the account in order to send the money back to the remitter. When there is a fraud and you call the bank and say, I think I'm involved in a fraud, that's a whole different setup. The banks know the bad guy's not going to get permission for the beneficiary bank to withdraw the funds. So what we do as a bank is we reach out to the back offices of all the different banks. We've all connected over the years to say, hey, this might be fraudulent. Can you freeze the funds? Don't make the deposit yet. Give us a chance to get a little bit more under the hood, and then we as the bank will work with our customer, who's the remitter, in order to obtain the necessary information in order to get that money back. The faster you can alert your bank, the better shot we have to get the money back. So the thing to take away from this is if you've unfortunately been a victim of this, is to, A, beforehand, make sure you understand from the bank you're with today, what do I do, who do I call, where do I go if I'm unfortunately involved in a wire fraud? Like I sent the money out to a crook and to the wrong bank account. Uh, you got to need to know where to call, who to talk to, and what to say. And then hopefully the bank and your bank today will behave in a way that they can help you in working with the beneficiary bank in order to get you the funds back. Um, certainly uh, the bank completes an internet complaint form. And certainly the remitter or yourself or the customer may have to indemnify the beneficiary bank in a way. Uh, but again, we've had instances where we've acted very quickly and we were able to get 100% of the funds back. We kind of beat the bad guy at his, at his or her own game. What you're going to see over the next few slides is another example of a real life uh, business email compromise. This was done through one of our clients, a settlement attorney here in New York. And this is the classic scenario I've mentioned before. They had a legitimate borrower who was anticipating $47,000 net proceeds of a refinance and was going to receive those funds in the form of a, an official check. Uh, the disbursement team for the law firm got an email from Richard Cantwell, uh, and you can see right away his email address. And Richard claimed that he was this person's partner and that they did not want to do a bank check uh, because of the hold that would be put on the check by their current bank. And uh, Mr. Cantwell would rather have a wire. So if we read the email, and I'll take a minute for folks to read it, um, it kind of takes you through the scenario that this was uh, you know, the day of the closing, the day of remittance, and it was, uh, what's the update regarding my loan proceed? Is there any possibilities I could have my proceed from my loan wired to my trust investment account today? I just discovered that my bank now maintained a 14 days hold, mandatory policy before clearing wire and check deposits. I would rather pay the wire fee to have my proceed wired to my trust to ensure immediate access please advise. Thank you, Richard. So if we take a look at that, one, one commonality we see in many of these business email scams is that, uh, again, the English language being one of the most difficult, 
is some folks of a foreign nationality have problems with plurals. Doesn't mean if you have problems with plurals, you're a cyber terrorist. Let me put that qualifier. But we do see this. So if you look at the email, and what we highlighted was, again, it doesn't really read that well. And again, hindsight being 2020, us being the bank, us taking a look at this after the fact, you could see the word proceed versus proceeds. You could see the word possibilities versus possibility. And here is the key. They just discovered that my bank now maintain, not maintains, a 14-day hold. So if we look through it, is we have a little bit of trouble with the English language, but more importantly, if, uh, in this case, the methodology of payment changed at the last minute. That's a huge red flag. So this communication between Mr. Cantwell, and another thing to look at is obviously his email address. Uh, his email address is closingdepartment@comcast.net. at comcast.net. There's, there's very rarely uh, you know, someone like an individual like Richard Cantwell would be working in the closing department at Comcast. So this is a classic uh, spoof, and I'll tell you a little more about the background of this. It's, it's kind of heartbreaking. Uh, this is another is the account is in is on our names and we'll like it wired to the account. The policy, this is about noontime on the same day. The policy also applies to certified checks. Please advise. So if we take a look at the uh, email, it says the account is on our names, not in our names, and we'll like it wired. It's not, not and we would like it wired or we will like it wired. And the policy also applies, not applies to certified checks. So one last email we'll take you through is the email with the actual bank account. So some of the familiar things we see from the previous slide, right? We see that below is the account I will, will like to have my proceeds wired to, and here's the uh, banking information. Please kindly acknowledge the wire transfer confirmation receipt immediately. The wire has been transmitted. So obviously we take a look at that and we see that the left phrase, please kindly acknowledge the wire transfer confirmation receipt immediately, the wire has been transmitted. It's a little clunky. And if you do take notice too, is the account name, uh, Susan Richard Cantwell Franklin. Well, Susan Franklin was an actual person. Uh, Susan Franklin was someone who was romanced on the internet uh, where Mr. Cantwell uh, had her give him his, his, first of all, Susan Franklin is not her name, it's a fake name, but give her the banking information, telling her that he was, you know, from out of the country, um, he was expecting some money, uh, he couldn't open a bank account, and could she do him a favor? And he kind of worked this woman for several months in order to set this up, in order to have a legitimate bank account be used as a mule account. That's the... Uh, the terminology used because the money hits that where then she would have wired the money to him overseas. Uh, this is, it's a, it's a sad story. The amount of money here was $47,000. Um, the good story here is that our client was well aware of what to do should this happen. Um, they saw in themselves a little bit of a lack of procedure. Um, you know, hindsight being 2020, they realized that the payment methodology changed. The account name was kind of funky there, Susan Richard Cantwell Franklin. Uh, again, banking on the fact that as long as the name is close, the bank will fund. And then certainly taking a look at the trans, uh, the back and forth and the transmissions and the communication, they said, yep, this is the classic business email compromise. They called us. We were able to work with the beneficiary bank. We were able to get the money back uh, 100%. And the better news is uh, Mr. Cantwell was arrested. Uh, in a rare case, the authorities were able to track him down and, uh, you know, bring him to, uh, to justice. So I'm going to turn it over to our team at NextGen. Thanks, Tom. Uh, that was scarily enlightening. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> yeah. um, I think that providing the real-life scenarios and those stories just emphasizes how prevalent these issues are. And I think we all know that fraud is fraud exists and it's out there, but we always kind of think, oh, it'll never happen to me. But when you look at those numbers and you see you know, how widespread this really is, I, it's really the responsibility of every individual to be aware of these things. So 
Thank you for sharing all that. Um, I just wanted to touch on for a couple minutes a few policies um, internally here at Next Generation that we also enact to help protect our clients' accounts. And I want to talk about it um, because it's also important for clients to comply with these policies and understand that um, I think, Tom, in a recent conversation, you had mentioned that safety is inconvenient. I think it was you that said that, wasn't it? Yes, ma'am, that was it me. Was. <laughs> And unfortunately, this is the case when it comes to, you know, some of these these policies and these requirements we have that oftentimes can just seem frustrating and seem to hold up the process of getting things done uh, with accounts here. But unfortunately, because of you know what exists today, we do this for security reasons and to protect our clients' accounts. So a couple things uh, just to reiterate that we do have here, and this is definitely not the full list, but we could talk all day about uh, some of these policies. Um, for anyone who wants to access information related to a client's uh, retirement account here that is not the actual account holder, we require a form to be completed, um, signed by the client, notarized, and the original mailed to us. And that form is an interested party uh, designation and or limited power of attorney form. So the account holder can designate another individual to call our office and ask for information related to that individual's account by completing that form and submitting the original to us. If they do not, we cannot share any information pertaining to the account with anyone other than the account holder. So oftentimes we'll have an investment contact call up and they're asking us about a client's account balance. And unfortunately we cannot provide that unless the client has deemed them to have access. Uh, so that's something that we come across a lot um, that, that can tend to frustrate people, but there is definitely a reason for that. Um, uh, credit card payments as well. Um, if we are taking a one-time payment for fees, for example, we can take a one-time payment over the phone, but anything that would constitute a recurring payment or putting a credit card on file to deduct payments, um, we have to have a form completed by the uh, account holder and cardholder that is signed and submitted back to us. Um, transferring of funds or moving funds out of next generation in, in any fashion, um, transferring to another financial institution out of a next generation account uh, requires a transfer form to be submitted and we need to have the original of that. Um, we require original signature um, if both the client and the receiving custodian uh, are signing original, we can accept that. Um, if we do not get a client's ori original signature, then we have to have the receiving custodian signature medallion guaranteed. Uh, it's just another layer of protection and security to ensure that it's an authorized request. Uh, same thing with any distributions out of an account. Any withdrawals, uh, we do require an original uh, form that is uh, with original wedding signature by the account holder, and we will often um, contact them to confirm as well, uh, but we have to have those original documents in order to process anything. Um, and there is the case in, with certain with certain forms, we will accept an electronic signature, uh, not those that I just mentioned, but others. And in that case, um, we will only accept DocuSign. And with DocuSign, we have to have the signature certificate uh, provided along with those electronic signatures that link back to the email address that was used to sign that document. So if we send a document to um, John Smith to sign related to his IRA, and we see that um, you know somebody named, I don't know, uh, Brittany Piquel, for example, <laughs> or Brittany Piquel's email address signed that form, um, obviously we're going to you know, have a concern there, and we're going to suspect that John Smith did not, in fact, sign that form or even authorize that um, that request. Um, same thing with any emails we send outside of the organization that contain uh, clients' personal information or any uh, specific identifying or financial information must be sent encrypted. Um, even if it's just sending uh, the client an email to say, "Congratulations, you opened your account with us. Your account number is one two three four. that still must be encrypted. So we use a share file account, which is a Citrix application to do that. Um, and then the last thing would be if somebody calls up asking um, for information about their account, 
we do have several steps of identity verification that we require in order to confirm that is in fact the account holder. Um, date of birth, social security, and other uh, specific identifying information we have to have in order to uh, reveal any, any information related to that. So again, I could go on, but I just wanted to touch on a few things and why it's important that our clients cooperate with these policies to protect their own funds and their investments. So with that, um, I don't know if we have any questions. I just wanted to put this up here again um, for, for anyone who might not have attended live today who maybe is watching this as a recording and maybe you do have questions that you didn't get a chance to ask live um, or you had questions for Tom, uh, feel free to reach out to us, uh, new accounts at nextgenerationtrust.com. You can call our office and speak to a live representative immediately. Or if you're just interested in more information and you want to follow us, uh, we're on all social media channels there as well. Um, let's take a look and see if we have any questions. Don't think we do. I know that we, we checked earlier. Yeah, it doesn't look like we do, um, Tom. So I think with that, we can wrap it up here. Again, uh, a recording will be provided to anyone who registered. Um, and we want to thank everybody for their time and hope this was valuable to all. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Have a great day. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. Have a wonderful day.